can be hard when you grow up People feel you with doubt You start thinking about what you're gonna do now And it's do or die, gotta make it count So lose your worries, let your problems go on Until my whole body burns out I ain't never gonna slow down Welcome everyone, this is Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I will be your mindset coach today. And today we're gonna to be talking about neurology. Today our guest, he is a board certified neurologist. We're gonna be talking about his work, what he does, how he helps people. But before we get into that, I really want to harp on the flow for this interview because the flow is definitely unique because what I like to do is to create a flow for the guest to speak on, for me to think on, and then for you to learn and then also immerse yourself into the conversation. Today was a lot of questions. It was, a, it was definitely more questions than I typically ask. But when you have someone with 30 plus years in the field, you want to ask these questions. You want to see the cause and the effect. Because one of the skills that I have, and if you're not familiar with the Clifton Strength Finder test, I encourage everyone to take that test, is really going to give you a hands-on guide to what you should be doing in your life. Yes, you can get a coach, you can get a mentor, that's going to be great. But if you take that test, you're going to at least have some type of guidance or more guidance than if you just kind of said, okay, well, let me do a bunch of trial and error. But with that being said, one of the skills is the ability to see the trial and error that people do. So if you eat a bunch of cheeseburgers, you get fat, right? That's easy to understand. But then we get into the mindsets of our culture and our world today. What would happen if we just stayed on our smartphones all the time? Many people do, but yet many people don't worry about the repercussions. People don't necessarily worry about diabetes because they eat a bunch of cake or they don't worry about obesity because they eat a bunch of hamburgers and pizza. There are things that people worry about and there's things that people don't worry about. Smoking, another example. What are you looking at? And so our conversation today is to give you insight of all the possible things that you could be looking at and maybe should be looking at. So let's get into that interview with my guest, Dr. Roberto Mixco. Welcome, Dr. Roberto Mixco to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? Doing great. Glad to have you on. We're going to be talking about your work today. You are a certified neurologist, and I just want to get straight into it. What got you into the field of neurology, and what is a neurologist? Well, when I was doing anatomy in the first few years of medicine, and we started doing this section in the brain and the spinal cord, I just got interested, you know, since then, because it was so complicated, I feel like a, this is interesting. So since then, I started getting interested in, in neurology. So you say the second question, what is a neurologist? Well, it's a specialized physician who deal with issues with the brain, like a Parkinson, dementia, the stroke, migraines, you know, your regular headaches. We also deal with problems with the spine. People could have a sciatic problem, to have a carpal tunnel, could have a facial paralysis, like a bell palsy, problem with your vision, seeing double. Everything involves the brain or the spinal cord and the nerves, because we also are uh, involved with the nerves issues. Like uh, somebody with peripheral neuropathy who has uh, diabetes uh, can develop numbness and tingling in the legs, and that can give you something is called neuropathy. That can affect your balance. How long have you been a neurologist? 33, 34 years. Okay, we're going to have a great conversation because one of the questions I want to begin with is when you began work, right, you know, 30 plus years ago, what was the state of the human mind? Were people suffering from more Parkinson's then, dementia then, or are you starting to see an uptick today? Or is it very similar to what it was 30 plus years ago? No, things has changed because the technology technology has improved. So easy to pick up diseases that we are not able to pick up, like a multiple sclerosis. We have a uh, MRI of the brain that can give you more detail about this. Before you have just CAT scan, 
when I started my training, we already had the first MRI, but when I was in medicine and doing internal medicine in my country, we didn't have CAT scan. That was uh, 1979. So I know I came to the United States, started my training here, but it's a tremendous change because in the past, neurology was famous for making a diagnosis and watch what happened they do, you know, because just watching the people see what happened to them, how they progress was terrible. But now we can have ammunition. We have stuff to do. We can help them. Either it's a uh, Parkinson, it's multiple sclerosis. When I came to practice neurology, we have basically a steroid for, for a multiple sclerosis. And then we have a first medication, like a five year later, and then another one, another one. We have like a 33 right now. There's so much medication for multiple sclerosis. So it's not like in the past when you get disabled, you have a mess. Now it's not like that. You, you get early, you've been treated. Parkinson has multiple ways to help them, even some brain surgery, you know. It's a new technology called Focus Ultrasound that can help to treat tremors. Parkinson, this new technology that's applied the uh, frequencies to the brain that can make some changes in the brain and improve your tremors. But yes, it's a big change. It's a, a stroke, especially. When I came, you have a stroke, a baby aspirin, that's it. Physical therapy, and God bless you, because that's it. Now we, we have tremendous changes in, in the way we deal with the stroke. So neurology has had two specialties now. Some neurologists deal with Parkinson, deal with multiple sclerosis. Some neurologists deal with uh, with stroke, even with, with just migraines. So medicine is changing in, in all categories, in cardiology, in neurosurgery. You have neurosurgeons specialized just in difficult brain tumors. It's amazing. Time to be right now practicing medicine. Yeah. We look at certain diseases or ailments like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, are those more genetic? Because if we look at a stroke, I mean, you could be young, have a stroke because you are on heavy drugs or maybe doing alcohol, where that might not be as genetic as if you developed Alzheimer's, but anyone can develop an illness similar to cancer. But when we look at the genetics of the body, have those started to change and evolve, maybe because of the foods that we eat, that now we start to see more of this more readily. Yes. Well, what happened is, by example, a stroke. You had a video that is genetic or can be familiar wrong in your family. Then that's a risk factor for the stroke because you have diabetes that wrong in your family. You see? So not necessarily the stroke is a, a gene for the stroke, but it's a gene for the factor that trigger the, or can produce the stroke, like hypertension or diabetes. And dementia, the same thing for Alzheimer's, the son, they have familiar Alzheimer's, have a gene. So we can type the type of gene that you have and increase the chances or not to have Alzheimer's. The same thing with Parkinson. So some particular person with Parkinson is familiar Parkinson, wrong in the families, but not everybody with Parkinson is familiar. And it's a distinction between genetic and familiar. Genetic mean what really wrong in your genes, but family when keep running in the families. But you could have, by example, somebody get pregnant, get a virus, and then tweak the gene, and that person could develop one particular illness, but it doesn't wrong in the family, it's wrong in him, and that won't hurt, you know. So it's a little different. Very interesting how times are becoming, you know, like with more technology and we have all of these devices that make our life easier, but then they can also make our life, I guess, maybe more difficult in the terms of we have too much screen time because our body wasn't used to getting all of this blue light that right. we get from our phones. You know, microwaves, all this stuff. At the same time, we need to take advantage of nature, you know, good food, good nutrition, even believe in meditation. That kind of stuff is really good and to be positive. That's very important to check yourself every morning or whenever you have time. It's not just pills or injections. It's also what you can do for, for yourself to improve, you know, exercise, good night's sleep, good nutrition, socialize. All that's very important. Very, very important. And you say like if you have time, but many people are living their life full scheduled. So that means they have a full schedule every single day. They wake up, they go on their smartphone, they go to work, they go on their smartphone, they come home, they watch TV, and then they go on their smartphone. We are busy, even though we have time. And many people, they don't realize that when they're looking at these screens for a long time, or they're hunched over because they're working from home now because they can work remote, they're starting to get these migraines now. My sister is currently suffering from a migraine 
as we speak because uh, she had a cold and then the cold kind of led to a migraine. But, you know, a cold can definitely do that. But it could be the habits, the foods we eat, how much self-care we are going to be doing. Are we being well? And then, of course, how much we're working. Are we sleeping properly? There are so many aspects to migraines. If you would, can we start to dissect the, the root cause to some migraines or to the majority of migraines and then how people can start to mitigate that or heal from it? Well, migraine is one of the conditions that has familiar tendencies. So I have migraine. My mom has migraine. My dad was migraine. My kid has migraine. So it's wrong in the families. So you need to look for the triggers. It could be a sinus problem. could be a TMJ problem. It will be arthritis in your neck. It will be because you didn't sleep properly every night. It will be because you eat the, the wrong foods. I mean, food, my wife cannot eat, by example, chocolate because they develop uh, migraines. Or some people drink red wine and get a migraine. So you have to look the laundry products, whatever you eat, whatever you touch, that can trigger a migraine. So you, that's the first step for migraine because I see migraines patients every day. And they say, listen, you need to look for the triggers. Changing weather. We are in Florida. The weather changes every five minutes, so I can have problems with, with migrants. Now, you make a point about people getting busy. You have to make the time. You need something really bad. You need to make the time. A few years ago, I was really busy taking call in the hospital, doing rounds. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I was running, preparing for a half marathon or a full marathon because we made the time. It was a lot of fun. So you have to make the time. Stop too much on your cell phone, too much on an iPad. Dedicate time for yourself. Then we get into the spine because you because you said you also do work with the spine, right? I was talking about this. I don't even know how long ago on the podcast where I was going past a bus stop and, and the kids are waiting for the bus and I'm going to the gym and all the kids are up looking down on their phone like this and their head is all the way down. And so their neck is like bent. And if you ever see just like a herd of students like walking out from school, if you're ever like, you know, because we live by a school and whenever the school ends, they, they come out, the buses, the parents pick them out. You can see most of the kids, they're looking down. They're big backpack. <laughs> yeah, they're looking I mean, they down. use a big backpack. I mean, they're going to figure, yeah, good posture is very important when you sit in front of the TV, in front of at work, you need to sit properly. So economic is very important, yes. There was an issue when I was growing up because the books were very heavy, right? We had thick textbooks and it was to give us as much information as possible. Yet today is every more digital. So people can have a Kindle or an iPad and all the information is on there. So they don't necessarily have to break their back with a lot of heavy books like we did, but they're they're doing the opposite. Now they have the ability to have light backpacks so they don't have to worry about back pain, but they're doing that phone thing where they're always looking down on their phone. And, and so can you see already in your work that more people are coming in with a spine that is a slanted forward and not in the correct position? No, that, but I guess that clearly could happen. You do for a long time because when you are young, probably you can do more for your spine, more damage. I mean, more, I mean, more heavy uh, work with not too much problem because you are young. But when you get older, then you get uh, more trouble. But yes, that could happen. You know, we've seen new illnesses coming along in medicine. What are some of those new illnesses that you're seeing? By example, uh, migraine, by example. And depending how much you spend time in the front of the the, the computer can give you migraines. Uh, I have a sister who was a, a computer engineer. I spent so much time, she damaged her, her eye, developed some condition that required surgery. She called keratoton, keraton, something like this. And since then, she barely uses a computer now because she they use a computer for her vision. So yes, I have to be careful. We're living in a catch-22 where we have to be relevant with the technology and we are trying to live life the fastest we can. So think of it as I want to do so much, right? We have our new generation. So think of like the younger kids. They want to retire early. They don't necessarily want to work. They just want to have fun, go explore the world, not have too many responsibilities. Some might settle down for a career. 
but the majority of them are are trying to retire early. That's just the idea of they don't want to work or they want to be able to work for themselves. The whole aspect is financial freedom, though. We look at that aspect to, to life. And I wanted to get into a hypothetical conversation now because this is going to be a meaning conversation because I'm sure when you were growing up, right, they talking about you work until you're 65 and then you retire. But yet today we're starting to have the mindset of we're going to retire early. Do you foresee that that could be an issue if people don't give themselves a purpose to live? Because I'm sure you see many people who give up because they have this ailment, you know, right? So they have Parkinson's. I'll never be the same. They give up on life. They give up eating well. They give up exercising. They have a migraine, so they give up going outside anymore. They give up all the things they love. Do you see that there could be a bigger issue if people don't find purpose in what they are doing? Yes, I've seen people need guidance, either in the school, but home with your family, because that when you get your guidance from your family and from, your, from the school, you know. I guess so the teacher has a big job to do, trying to guide these students, these young brains, you know, prepare for the future. But you are right, you know, technology is, is too inviting, you know, it's, it can be a, addictive. <laughs> it does make your job easier, though, because cause you said when you first started, it was children's aspirin and good luck, you know, get some rest. But today we have so many more tools and the medical industry kind of gets a bad rap for this where now they have the ability to prescribe so many other alternatives, drugs, things along those lines. I know you don't work with depression, but just think of it as you can give someone depression meds. Doctors will do that more readily than say, okay, in order for you to get out of this situation, you have to do everything that's going to make you well. Not so much of giving them a prescription, but giving them advice to living a better lifestyle. Think of it as if we took away all the technology, all the prescriptions, would we be in a better place today? Yes, bro. It's a tough question because you know, it's confusing too. Yeah, it's confusing because technology in the right way can be very helpful. There's no question about it. But we cannot practice medicine without forgetting our roots, I guess. And when I was growing up, we, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't, that didn't exist, you know. You go outside in the park, play basketball with your friends. You know, that's it. They play soccer, but no iPad, no nothing like that. Nothing. I mean, that's even we didn't have even color TV. That's black and white TV. We watch uh, the World Series and by radio. Just by radio. We had no TV watching the games. So everything has changed. Now you have a huge TV in front of you and watch a game that you know can see four games at the same time. Mm -hmm. This is you know life where it evolves. And we do have to look at, well, if we see that life is evolving this way and we can start to mitigate things like our bad health ailments coming our way, like, again, migraines, uh, Parkinson's, again, you know, like, I'm sure there's going to be ways where you can mitigate it to some degree, similar to diabetes. If you have diabetes in your family, you're not going to probably want to eat a bunch of sugar. But, you know, like even if you do eat some sugar, you don't eat any sugar, there is the possibility that you can develop it. So there's always the chance you can develop it. But then there's the aspect you can do things to make your life better. And the the aspect to health, many people, they don't necessarily look at their health until something is broken. Yeah, and that's true. They wait until they get that doctor's note, you know, from you. They say, hey, Dr. Mixco, I'm not feeling well. And then, well, the reason why you're not feeling well, you tell them, is because of this, because they have been doing X, Y, and Z consistently over a long period of time. And even if we tell them, hey, you need to be careful not to eat too much sugar, to you know, go out, meditate, as you said, have some level of fitness, people, it's kind of like one ear, you know, and then out the other. It's like they know what they have to do, but they don't do it. Why do you think people wait to go into your office to get bad news from you instead of taking action today? I don't know. You can call like a, a little bit of laziness. I mean, I mean it's too much comfort, you know. It's, you don't want to have an effort, you know. You don't have the ethics to, to work in other directions, like a preventing good food. You know, there's good food out there. Uh, those, you know, I mean, 
all these companies that want to sell you all the food that they have, all the, the fast food, but you, you are the one who decided to look for the, the best food, you know. Best food can help you to to prevent cancer, can help you to decrease the chances to have cancer, decrease the chances to have Parkinson. Everybody with Parkinson, they have to take some special vitamins to be sure that that help them. Lack of vitamin B12 can give you a lot of issues, memory problems, numbness in your legs. Good nutrition is really important. I mean, but as I mentioned before, guidance, you need guidance for your family, guidance from your school, hopefully from the government. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and today, like our conversation is definitely the guidance part for helping people understand more about their health and their wellness and what could be possible if they don't take care of themselves today. But our school system and even parents don't necessarily speak about this. Like my parents never talked to me about, you know, being healthy and and making sure I, I'm I'm eating the right foods because they gave me ham and cheese sandwiches and they gave me jello and they gave me fruit snacks, foods that are not good for you. But that was the lifestyle. And many children are having that lifestyle today where they're eating all of these junk food, they're getting their processed foods. And I mean, we probably have more processed foods today than ever in history. And it's because it has become the norm. If you're ever hungry, you go get some ramen noodles, you get some Doritos, you get something quick. It's not about cooking good food anymore. And it's not about giving ourselves good education for how to eat healthy. So people don't even know that, oh, I'm going to go to McDonald's and I'm going to go get a hamburger and I'm going to get French fries and I'm going to get a salad. And they think just because they got a salad that they're being healthy, where they're doing a but lot of bad healthy, things. healthy is amazing. <laughs> doing a lot of bad things in their life, but they're not focusing on the good stuff only. This is sad, you know, have the wrong concept. I have patients who say, Dr. Misko, I'm very healthy, you know, until I have this accident, you know. It's, yeah, but, you know, you say, you weigh 290 pounds, you know, and you think you're healthy. And they think they're healthy. <laughs> Even they're 100 pounds overweight, you know. Interesting. I mean, it's amazing. In their mind, they, are, they were healthy until they had the car accident. The concept of healthy has changed, I guess. Are you familiar with the body positive movement? Not exactly. Maybe. I'm not, not sure. I can tell you. So the body positivity movement is a movement. It's not necessarily only for women, but it is predominantly women with this mindset where they are saying that no matter their size, they're big and beautiful, right? They're beautiful regardless of their size. So if they're 300 pounds obese, it doesn't matter. They're beautiful still. It takes away some accountability from them to take action. Because if we go back to the 90s, you know, like around the 90s, when you looked at like a swimsuit, um, you know, Illustrate magazine or models, they were in shape, they were slender. And then now if you go to a, a box store, a clothing store, whatever, you see mannequins that are plus size. They're making it more apparent to people that it's okay to be a little bit overweight. And that's why we have that posi the, the body positivity movement, because they're just saying, it's okay, you can stay exactly how you are. That mindset is stopping people from changing and getting more healthy because they don't see it. I see it. So you see, this is like a negative thing because they want to tell them that being overweight is okay. Well, I just wanted your take on it. Like, what do you foresee that doing to people? Because we look at the obesity, I, you know, just a couple of years ago, I think two years ago, women finally surpassed men over the age of 45 being obese. 42.3%, I believe, is, is around the number of women over the age of 45 are obese. And 38 point something, I think 6% of men are obese over the age of 45. We can see the numbers going up for women or a lot more quickly because of the body positivity movement versus the men, we are held by different uh, standards. We don't necessarily have the body positivity movement. If we are big and we're fat, we get made fun of. Yeah, that's right. I see your point. You know, obesity is an epidemic in this country. I mean, it's an epidemic. You go to, you, you you have the chance to go in another country in Europe. People are less obese than here. I don't know, they, they walk more, they eat better, they're more relaxed, less stress. Yeah, well, epidemic is, obesity is an epidemic in this country. Mm -hmm. Anything that can help to improve that is a plus, no question about that. So would you say that a larger amount of, no pun intended, of your clients 
coming in today versus 30 years ago are overweight and obese. Yes. Would you say there's a correlation to being obese and and then having more illnesses readily come into your life? Yes. Yes, I guess the TV influence eating more, go eating junk food, all the stuff. It's a difference. Yes. Fast, there's no, there was no fast food, basically. I didn't live in that time, but in my country, the same thing happened down here. I mean, we I am from El Salvador. So over there, everybody has the same thing, a cell phone, an iPad, TV, the same, the same thing, you know. It influenced you to eat not the best way. So yes, that does increase the chance of, to have more problems when you are older. If you can go back, you know, 30 years or 30 plus years from when you started and if you can give a message to the world, to the health organizations, CDC, whoever, right, that you can give them advice before we got to where we are today, where we have rampant obesity, rampant ailments in people, whether it be Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, migraines, what would you advise them to start to do and implement? I think we all had the responsibility either you're a teacher or a parent or work for the government or work in a special organization to try to teach better health, uh, better nutrition in all directions. I mean, it's not just people in the government. Everybody should have the responsibility to teach. Even you have a younger brother, even you have a, a young niece, or you know, to teach them one by one. I mean, everybody has that responsibility. We should get together and be that effort, you know. Mm -hmm. What would be some of the first things that you teach them? Would it be like nutrition, like your foods, or would it be more of like the mind and the body? Because I I didn't study here in, in this country when I was in high school or elementary school, so I don't know what they teach that here, but you know, they should focus on in, in good health, how to prevent good health, and that could be the, the nutrition, more I guess education about your own body, to know how this thing work and education is the biggest problem we have. They should know what is diabetes, how bad diabetes can be, can affect your eye, can affect your heart, you know, can affect your the, your heart. Hypertension, the same thing. So basic, the two biggest enemies in this country, are hypertension and diabetes. <laughs> so yeah, that's sure. something that, you know, everybody, young kids should know about that. So you start thinking in your own future, you know. When I was in high school, we had a personal wellness class. And in the class, we would talk about nutrition. We would talk about the different things. Like if you did smoking, they have pictures of the lungs, what would happen to the lungs. And also like uh, certain things like diabetes, cancers, they'll show you pictures. But the thing about that is it was only for like half a semester. So about nine weeks or something like that. And that was it. Like you only had to do it one time in high school and not every high school does it. That's a great idea. I mean, I hope that they could do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so like every single year, I think would be a better option than just to have it once for your whole four years in high school that you have to take a personal wellness class, like to make it important, just how we make reading and writing and math important. We should do that to like our education for our wellness. It will be easy to get good score too. <laughs> yes, a wellness class, that will be great. And that's going to mitigate a lot of the things that happen later on in life. The burden for the whole country, the whole society, you know, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Then we should start the, the fight. <laughs> and that is definitely the goal, you know, to get people in a better mindset, better bodies, better health, to live a better, fuller life. Because a lot of people, they wait to truly live. They give themselves an idea that they'll do it later. But when they're a little bit older, they start to get these, you know, back problems or neck problems, or they're not able to do things like they used to do. And it stops them from finding true happiness in their life because they see their life for what it was rather than what it is right now or what it could have been if they only gave some attention to themselves. There is a whole issue, especially here in America, where we do have to provide more education for individuals to get into a better physical and mental wellness. As we begin to wrap up, I would love to get some final words from you so you could talk about anything you would like. And then for you to tell the audience where they can find you, look up what you have done, if you have a website or social media, 
anything would be great. I would like to do is uh, talk a little bit about the stroke because that one, the reason to talk to you is uh, talk about a book that our little man and I wrote, you know. About 800,000 people in the United States have a stroke every year. Almost 1 million, 800,000. And about 300,000 has problems with the speech. They cannot spread themselves. Most of them really eventually get better after two, three months with speech therapy, physical therapy get better. But about 50 to 60,000 people never ever able to able to talk again ever. And that cannot write neither. So these people are really in a big problem because they cannot communicate. So you go to the hospital, you see all these doctors, all the neurologists, all the you get the CAT scan, the physical therapist after a week, they send you to a rehab center. And the rehab center, one more time, a speech therapy, physical therapist, but you're never able to talk, then you go home. So at home, the family doesn't know what to do with you because your grandpa is always cranky, sitting in front of the sofa watching TV, and you don't know how to communicate with them. You ask with yes and no question. Are you hungry? I say no. Are you the upset? No. You need to go to the bathroom, no? But you don't know what they want because they cannot tell you what they want. So what happened after a few weeks, the patient gave up. A few more weeks, the family gave up. And then you had a piece of furniture in the house. So this is about 50,000 people every year in this country that have that situation. So I had the idea to make a difference for that. They signed it, maybe a, a little book that I can show you here. I don't know if I can see well, but anyway. Okay, I can see from there. So this book is like a little manual that had the idea to use sign language, but only using one hand. Because when you have the real sign language, you use both hands. But these people are paralyzed one side. They cannot use one side and they cannot talk. So I decided to use like a little manual language. You can use one hand to communicate, to connect with your family. Because you can tell what you want. You need to go to the bathroom. You just put your finger like this. I mean, I need to go to the bathroom. Because you still have one hand. You can communicate with one hand. So this is the basis to open the communication back in your family with your friends. And everybody can learn this 100 signs that have in this book in three or four weeks. And the little book is about 100 pages, black and white, also in color. It's an ebook. It's an Amazon. I think if they reach to the right people, the speech therapists, nurses, nursing home, physician, and everybody, because almost everybody knows anybody has a stroke. So hopefully, eventually, this book can make a difference in a lot of people. I know they already make a difference in some of them. I see that here in my office. So that's the reason I was going to you know, use this few minutes for that. I appreciate your time. Um, I, yes, I have a website. It's very simple to go. Yes, drrobertomisco.com. That's basically what it is. And then you can get to my website, in which tell you a little more what when when I study, how long you've been in this country, and so on. And really appreciate all your questions because. Yeah, we need to make a difference. Everybody has to take responsibility. And you have a great show, sir. This, this is really great. I listen to podcasts. They're really nice. I saved Stroke for last because because I knew the work that you did. And I wanted to end on the note of I'm going to be putting that book in the description box below so people can easily find it. If they have a family member that has suffered from a stroke, they can get the ebook. They can go to Amazon. They can get this book for them so they can begin to, you know, give them some hope and some help. Because when you're healing from a stroke, my father had a stroke because he kept drinking alcohol, but he was able to do almost a full recovery. He was fortunate, but there's going to be people who are going to be struggling and any help that they can get is going to give them a better mindset. It's going to give them a better mentality to heal and get better because when they are trying to recover from this there are going to be limitations but one of the biggest limitations is themselves in their mind because if they give up because they can't do the same things that they used to do it's going to be like you said they're just going to be a piece of furniture in the house and we don't want that for them i appreciate the work that you do and i appreciate you coming on and talking about all of the nuances of the new world where it comes to our technologies and our health. And then also, you know, writing the book and helping people who are suffering from stroke or who have suffered from stroke. As always, I want to thank you, Dr. Roberto Mixico for coming on and spending some time with us today. All right, everyone, I'd like to thank you so much for watching that interview with Dr. Roberto Misco and myself. As you can see, we talked about so many different aspects of ailments. You can have Alzheimer's, that's on my mom's side of the family. My dad's side doesn't necessarily have that, but my dad's side has diabetes. So 
I'm at risk for diabetes for my dad, Alzheimer's for my mom. What I have noticed from that is if you're not taking care of yourself, it happens so much more quickly and it almost happens like, you know, you get like blindsided, like you didn't check your blind spots when you were driving or something and you crash into someone or someone crashed into you because they didn't check their blind spots. In a sense, when we have these possibilities for something to happen in your life, some people, you know, they suffer from cancer in their families, maybe Parkinson's, what we talked about today, that is going to be something they have to look at preventative measures. What I will say is people deteriorate very quickly sometimes when it comes to certain ailments, right? It's like one second you see them and then the next moment you're like, you can hardly recognize them or their mind is starting to slip. In a sense, we can not recover from all the hard things that we have done in our life. So if you have been in construction and you have bad knees now, right? Those knees were the product of you doing construction for so many years. Now, that's just one example. Imagine being on your smartphone or watching TV for long periods of time, or not consuming meaningful educational content. All of these things can be recipes for disaster. Most people, they want good lives. You know, they want to live until they're 100, or they want to live forever, maybe, and they want to be young forever. But the reality is we all grow up. We all grow old, and then eventually we all die. What happens right before death is typically a fraction of what we were in life. And it could be scary. It could be disheartening because now you can't do some of the things that you could always do. Maybe you could drive and you could drive far. You could walk fast. You could run. But today you don't drive. Maybe you can't see at night. Maybe you can't necessarily walk that well. You need a walker or a cane. What can we do to make sure that you can have a longer, healthier life. We do have to look at all the things that are going on in your mind, be it good, be it bad. What do we have to prepare you for? This is going to be a conversation. And I know we ended off on the aspect of stroke and helping individuals who have stroke communicate effectively and efficiently so they can be less frustrated. That is going to be a huge asset for people who are struggling with that. It is frustrating. I remember I was speaking with my dad. I don't mean to throw his business out, but I am. When he had the stroke and everything, I asked him, I was like, well, what was going on in your mind? What happened? What did you do? How did it feel? I was curious, you know, and he, he told me everything. The things he focused on when he was recovering was the things he couldn't do that he could do so easily before. Walking up the stairs, you know, doing push-ups, making his own food, things along those lines, right? The simple things, but we take them for granted. We don't necessarily look at our life for all the things that we can do right now. Later on, we're going to look at life for what we can't do. For the moments in our life, we look at what we can't do. And you might say, well, that's a later problem. But we can give ourselves that mindset right now. And I talk about this analogy quite often because it's so effective in helping people understand what is truly wellness. Imagine you have a common cold. It doesn't have to be anything grandiose, right? It doesn't have to be a fancy flu or virus or whatever. It you know, it's just a common cold. You have a cough, maybe you have a sore throat, maybe you have a fever, and guess what? You don't feel good. When you're not feeling good, You curse every single sneeze, you curse every single tissue, every single time you have to taste that nasty cough syrup, and you say, ugh, I can't wait until I feel better. And you know what happens when you feel better? You forget that you were sick. You forget that you suffered. And you just continue with the same old life that you did before. Maybe no vitamins, maybe no going to the gym. You literally do the same exact thing. You could get knocked down real, real good like a stroke and you start to change a lot more. I have found that even then, people will still slip back into their old way of life and habits, especially if things get better very quickly. We need to give ourselves some urgency. We need to give ourselves 
the mindset that our mind, though it be powerful, is also going to be weak to comfort. It's going to be weak to time if we're not giving it the proper education. Our mind, our brain is a muscle, yet many people don't flex that muscle. Many people, they just wither away in front of their electronic devices, and then they wonder why later on in life they have to have all these hardships. So if you're a person that maybe has already gone through those hardships, we can begin to take some steps back and to see if there's some alternative paths for us. But maybe you're fortunate. Maybe you do not have any ailments right now. You are the epitome of fitness and of mindset and of well-being. That right there has to be sustained throughout your life. When I go to the gym and I see these 70, 80-year-old men in the gym and women in the gym, they look great. They're there. They're going on the Stairmaster, you know, seven, eight, nine level, and they're kicking butt. Yet, you get a 22-year-old that hasn't worked out a day in their life, and you put them on that Stairmaster, they're huffing and puffing, and grandma and grandpa are over there doing laps on the person, right? This cannot continue. I know that it is going to continue, but it cannot continue. If you're a parent, if you're an educator, if you're someone you're listening to this episode, understand that you are responsible for your life and anyone that's around you, you need to be that example for them and educate them to help them along the way so that when they are finally at a point in their life where things are good, they want to maintain that good and not just let it slip through their hands. Most people don't realize what they got until it's lost. So don't wait until you lose the goodness in your life. Don't wait until you get a bad doctor's note to take action. Don't wait for that big T trauma. Today can be the day you take action. And I encourage you to check out all the links in the description box below. I encourage you to pick up a copy of Dr. Mixco's book. And if you know anyone who's suffering from stroke or who has suffered from stroke, get them a copy. If you are a health practitioner, a nurse, doctor, whatever, Bring it into your hospital and you can give it to the appropriate person that can give that to a family that might be in need. So with all that being said, your health is important, your mind is important, and you are in charge of the most important thing in the world, you. If you can make things happen, you can make everything happen around you too. The people smile, the people grow, you embellish what is around you. But you have to first take care of yourself. With all that being said, continue to take care of yourself. Continue to support yourself in every which way you can right now. It might be a small step today, but it's going to be a big change in the future. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, email me coaching at session at gmail.com and I'll be more than happy to help you on any of your endeavors. Until the next episode of Coaching in Session, everyone take care.